Hey guys, this is Corey McCormick, and you're listening to Gym on Base. The Gym on Base show has teamed up with my new friends at Old Hillside Bourbon Company. I got two of my favorite bottles here, Straight Bourbon Whiskey and the Straight Rye Whiskey. So whenever you want to get on base with that authentic Kentucky bourbon taste, make sure you visit OldHillsideBourbonCompany.com, their social media, Old Hillside CO, or pick up a bottle at BevMo and Total Wine, Old Hillside Bourbon Company. They'll always get you on base. Welcome back to another episode of the Gym on Base Show. For today's very special guest, we have on one of my favorite bass players. You've seen and heard him with the likes of Lucas Nelson, Chris Cornell, Neil Young, and even Willie Nelson. He hails from Truckee, California. Please welcome the great Corey McCormick. Corey, thanks for coming on. Hey, Ryan. Good. Thanks for having me, man. Really stoked to be here. Yeah, excited to have you on the show. And we kind of were talking before we started. Uh, you have an off day today, right? You're in uh, South Carolina right now. You're on tour with uh, Lucas Nelson. That's right. Uh, we played Merle Fest last night and uh, came up here and uh, we got a day off. And I just been kind of talking with the family and catching up on emails and stuff. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Doing the dad life, right? Doing the dad life. I'm in deep. I got two young, young kids. <laughs> so, uh, try to stay connected with them as much as possible while I'm out here. And you know you've made it right in the music business when you have your own hotel room, right? <laughs> I think that is some there's something to that. Yeah. Well it makes me wonder too, like uh when you're on like a long tour, um, you know, maybe a month or longer, how many roller bags and like backpacks do you bring? Like uh, is there kind of a strategy to that or how you load up? Um well it's uh, I never I've never been one to bring a whole lot on tour. Uh, We're lucky now we have uh, wardrobe cases that go with all the gear. Mm. So I don't really have to bring a whole lot. I can load up the wardrobe cases with what I'm going to have for show attire, you know, which usually takes up a lot of luggage space, hats and shoes and things like that, you know, Um, big, you know, jackets. Uh, So it's nice to have those. I think that that's another uh, sign of making it like have (laughs) wardrobe cases, you know, Uh, but it's really nice to have those. So really I just have one, one bag, you know, one roller bag. That's a little, you know, on the medium large side and a, and a backpack. That's all I bring. Nice. Well, how does it work with, uh, with laundry? Is there like a designated laundry day or how do you handle that? Uh, I usually bring, enough stuff to where like i i'm cool i don't need to do laundry maybe like once a week okay no and and or i can stretch it um but yeah i i usually try to feel it out a lot of time venues have laundry so even Mm -hmm. if i have a little bit of dirty clothes i'll wash just because it's free and uh and easy (laughs) um um, but yeah i kind of just play it by ear and and uh you know for the show clothes we have like a bag we all put our sweaty dirty clothes in and those go to like a dry cleaner so we don't have to worry about that so okay. yeah and uh since you are on tour it made me think of some kind of tour specific questions like after a show do you guys hang out as a band like on the bus and like just play cards that kind of thing or is there is it there's still music involved like acoustic type jamming or how does it go usually for you well last night we uh we, we the bus we're on right now belongs to the beach boys apparently mm. um and so we were inspired and on the drive last night we we just sat in the back lounge uh anthony the drummer and uh and i and one of our tech guys and we just blasted a bunch of beach boys uh music you know generally there's there's usually a card game going on i'm not much of a game player so that's usually just like lucas and uh and Logan, uh, they do a lot of mm. stuff. Logan's creating his own. Well, he's already created it, but he's trying to get it out in the market. It's a, it's a game uh, based off of uh, an old Italian card game, but mm. he enhanced it and added some elements. They have a great time doing that. Um, normally, I'm just doing my, you know, listening to music or. I am on the old man schedule now. So it's like after a show, I usually eat a little food and I go to sleep. Oh, so you're able to wind down pretty good then. Yeah. You know, I, I got onto a schedule at home during the pandemic mm-hmm. where I was getting up at four in the morning and, uh, 
I was doing that so that I could get a workout in and then have the whole day to be productive and spend time with the kids and all that. Um, mm. And so when I started touring again, it was like I had flipped some weird switch to where no matter what time zone I was in or no matter how much sleep I got, I'm waking up at four or five in the morning. You know, that also might be old age. <laughs> uh, but uh, so I get up so early that, you know, at the end of show, I'm done, man. I'm mm -hmm. I'm like, if I just sit down, I'm asleep, you know, I, uh, <laughs> I, definitely another kind of old man style thing. Well, speaking of, uh, you know, being tired after shows, it made me wonder, because, you know, you get into it, you're jumping around on stage. So what do you like to drink on stage? Are you just a water guy or is there anything special that you like to keep hydrated? Yeah, usually I have a, a nice cold, icy soda water. That's mm. my normal every show thing. But there are times I don't drink like I used to drink. I still have occasional drink, but uh, so now it's there's some nights where I'll have a beer up there or some champagne, something kind of light. Uh, but yeah, I don't really drink booze anymore. It's mostly like soda water, bubbly water. Well, nowadays you got to be healthy, right? Because you got to fight the whole dad bod thing, you know? <laughs> well, really, I gave up the drinking because of the hangovers. <laughs> and it was uh, honestly, I think, contributing to uh mental health issues mm -hmm. and uh drinking's terrible for you i yeah. gotta say no i'm not against it i still like i said occasionally i got to the point now where i can just have a drink and and be cool when i was younger it was like you know once the floodgates opened it was drinking until i fell flat face first into the bunk <laughs> um and then suffered all day long. And really, it, it it's also about being productive. You know, too much drinking made me unproductive because then I'd sleep till noon or whatever and, and not be as not if not focused at all and definitely not able to work out or do do the things that I'm doing now that kind of help with mental health and help with just longevity. You know, I'm I had my first child when I was 40, so I'm trying to play the long ball at this point. Well, uh, speaking of, you know, being fit and stuff, uh, I was wondering, how do you get your workouts in? Like, do you, are you a re resistance band guy in the hotel room or how do you kind of do make it happen? Oh, there you go. <laughs> well, I use these more for like stretching type stuff, but I do have like different sizes of them in case I don't have a gym, but normally the, the hotels have a gym. So I'll be up early and, and try to get the routine in before we have to you know, usually you have to check out of the hotel around 10 or 11. So mm -hmm. I got to get up and get that in. And uh, that last tour we did, we didn't have uh, hotels on show days. So that was a bit of a challenge. I actually, I lost like five pounds of muscle on that mm -hmm. tour because I didn't have weights. I didn't have anything like that. And uh, I ran a lot. So it, it it's challenging. The hardest part about health stuff on the road is, is nutrition you know being right and eating at the right times and you know i when i'm at home we cook and i never eat out so my stomach has an adjustment period when mm. i come out on the road and it's a little different <laughs> i eat a lot of food on the bus i prepare my own food mm. on the bus smoothies and sandwiches and things like that you got a good look going you know we, you spoke about your hats earlier so i was wondering where do you get your hats is it like a certain shop or do you how many do you bring on tour yeah i i usually bring just a couple out just to have a couple different options you know so I'm not wearing the same thing every night but uh i've been blessed with my, my favorite hat the purple hat that has the has saturn on it that's mm. all hand stitched and a bunch of details that was a gift from my friend Martha uh, and it was made by uh, my friend Charlie at Lone, Lone Hawk Hats. He's mm. amazing hat maker. One of my favorites that I've ever seen, really. He he takes old hats and he reshapes them and, and does really great work. And then his wife, she's really good at the embroidery. She does it all by mm. hand. So that was a gift. And then I have... Uh, there's another really great hat I got from Willie's bass player, Kevin. He had this cool Stetson white 
real stiff hat and it didn't fit him right. And he just like, you want this guy? It's like, hell, it fit <laughs> perfect. Um, so a lot of them have been gifts. I haven't really spent a lot of money on, on fancy hats. I can't really afford to do that. There's, <laughs> you know, just kind of picking them up from, I got a nice one at, a, at luck reunion one year from worth and worth the really nice hats. Uh, just the kindness of strangers. I'm a hat guy, so I'm always like looking, you know. Yeah. Well, you got you got the beanie on today, so it's, I guess it pays off to be a cool guy, right? It's people want to, you know, might give you a hat here and there. <laughs> hey, man, you know, it helps. Yeah. It's to be a nice guy, yeah. And how old are your two sons? Yeah, my uh, Ellis is six, and uh, Kai is just about to turn four. His birthday's uh, May fourth, so about. Ah. Is oh yeah. Do they get to join you on the road or once you're gone, you're gone? Or how does that work? In the beginning, Ellis was on the road a bunch. He came on a bunch of the uh, meal tours that mm -hmm. we did. He went to Europe with us. and uh, uh, But Kai hasn't really done a lot of the touring because of, uh, you know, it's just kind of exponentially harder when you add the second kid for for mm -hmm. my wife to travel with them and, and – uh, and the six-year-old, you know, Ellis has all these commitments now at home. So it's it's not as easy to just leave. And uh, how we're touring now is a little more condensed. So there's not really the room, you know. But they come to the shows when, when, we're, when we're in L.A. And they, they come hang out and watch Daddy play. <laughs> That's cool. How about, uh, how about your wife? How did you guys meet and how long have you been married? Uh, so in 2010, the same year I joined Lucas's band, I went to, to Japan. Uh, I, the year before, played on a record for a Japanese artist in L.A. And uh, then they asked me to go do the tour. And so I went to Japan. And I before I went there, I asked a friend of mine who worked at Tokyo Disney for a lot of years. She lived over there. You know, I hit her up and was kind of like, you know, coming to Tokyo, she wasn't there anymore, but I was looking for there's people to hang out with and what's there to do type of thing. And, and, uh, looking for maybe someone with, uh, with a little, maybe a herb contact, you know? <laughs> um, and she's like, well, there's this really cool chick. She works at this bar in Ropungi, which is the main kind of area, which I was living kind of right there. And this friend of mine always kind of wanted a romantic relationship, but we, I just, we were friends and it anyways, she's like, I don't want to introduce you to this girl. Cause you're going to fall in love with this girl, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, come on, just who is it? And I'm like, put me up. I'm going to be there alone, you know? And so she, that ended up being Naoko, my wife. Uh, in uh, and I got a hold of her when I went over there, she avoided me for first two weeks. She wasn't having it, um, <laughs> at all. And then one of her customers, she worked in kind of like a high end bar, and one of the customers that came into the bar worked for Sony and he was kind of this old dude, old Japanese dude who, uh, who was a big fan of the artist that I was playing with. And so he wanted to meet me. So she set up this meeting with this guy. It was the most crazy experience ever. Like, so I was all excited to meet her. I didn't really care about this dude. It's just like, whatever, you know, I, I was kind of like, Oh, that's cool. It's the guy that works at Sony wants to meet, you know, I, I don't know. I'll go and see what he has to say, but I was more excited in the opportunity to like actually meet her. And, uh, and so she set up this lunch. He, he rented out a whole restaurant. So it was just us in the restaurant, right. Mm -hmm. In this place. And, uh, and I, I went there on a break between rehearsal times. We had like two hours off and I was starving cause I hadn't eaten and he was hammered already drinking. <laughs> And trying to get me to drink, but I'm, you know, I got to go back to work and I wanted to eat. There's all this food on the table. He's not eating. So I felt rude. I didn't know what to do. It was a little awkward. So I wasn't really eating. And he proceeds to t try to get her to like do sexual things with me. Like, why don't you grab his leg? And why don't you like kiss him on the cheek? And, why and in Japanese. So the whole time they're talking and she's kind of giggling and kind of bouncing him back and 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 uh and then she he goes to the bathroom and she enlightens me to what's going on and and uh 
And so it was just a very, uh, she really impressed me in that first meeting of how she handled that situation because the guy was such a creep, you know, but mm -hmm. so above it and just kind of, I don't know, she's handled it so well. And then we hung out that night and, and uh, we spent the next three months together there in Japan. I was there for three months and I proposed to her at the end of that trip. And, and uh, that's the rest 14 years later. Now we got two kids and still the rest going, is history, <laughs> as they say. Well, I saw a video of you guys. I think it was you, your wife and your kids, maybe about a month ago at the most. Uh, look like you guys were skiing. So I was wondering, were you guys back home in Truckee or where were you guys at? We did. We went to Tahoe. My friend has a, a nice little tiny little cabin in Tahoe City. And so we went up and I showed them the first house I ever lived in and uh, kind of took them around Tahoe Donner and showed them the lake there. And and um, and then we we went snowboarding. We went to Diamond Peak, which I had never been to that mountain. It's good family hill. Kids were free. My six-year-old finally started turning both ways, toe edge and heel edge. So we were actually riding together. It was really good. It was a good nice. trip. It snowed, you know, it was great. Have you heard of uh, Tracy then? That's where I grew up, not too far from Tahoe. Tracy. Oh, yeah. yeah that's, that's where I'm from, very exotic area. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I was curious. I, I know you dabble in all genres, jazz, rock and roll, funk. Uh, where do you get your music taste from, do you think? Um, I think that, uh, it's an interesting question. I, a lot of it, a lot of the early music I heard was what my dad listened to, which was primarily singer songwriter, kind of older rock and roll, but something about pop music and funk and, and uh, just grabbed me at an early age when I started going to the roller rink and hearing that music. There wasn't any real, uh, my dad, there wasn't any black music in my house, mm. like no jazz, no funk or R&B, nothing, not even Ray Charles. It was not that my dad was like racist or anything, but just what <laughs> any of that in the house. So when I started roller skating at a young age, that's when I started to get, uh, you know, blanking on the word I'm looking for, but exposed, there we go, exposed to the, to that world of music stevie wonder and michael jackson and, and and the jazz stuff came in just from school playing in school and being uh, having a good teacher in junior high who was like check this record out check this artist you know look at miles davis look at this mm. these cats and and uh and uh something about the jazz aesthetic really grabbed me uh early on improvised music and and uh the sound of acoustic i really like acoustic jazz the timbre of the instruments and how it all works together is to me the most beautiful music on earth which classical music fits into that too i feel like jazz pulled from classical music and took it into you know there's more of a steady rhythm and stuff but classical music has that's where that beauty of that music comes from mm -hmm. you know well i know you're uh you mentioned uh some jazz there and sometimes even with your sunglasses uh it, it kind of reminds you of miles davis a little bit so some of the influence there so I, I know you grew up playing trumpet initially right i did I was, that was my first instrument i played that from fourth grade all the way till my first year of college uh still have my horn i don't really <laughs> much um it got to be a, a little bit too much work for me when you play a horn it's a lot of maintenance it's basically you're strapped to having to do these long warm-ups every day it's tough it's tough to get up so early in the morning and put that cold hard metal on your face <laughs> just started to get old to me yeah. uh, it felt better to put cold hard metal on my fingertips <laughs> Well, uh, when it comes to, you know, growing up, being into music at a young age, uh, being near Tahoe, I think of that outdoor spot at Harvey's. Like, where was your first concert and who was it? First major concert uh, was Rick Springfield, I think. 
it wasn't my <laughs> choice it was just <laughs> went to with my dad he didn't take me to a lot of shows i didn't mm. see a lot of shows until i was able to go to them myself and even then i wasn't going to like i didn't go to a lot of rock shows as a youth i was going to more the underground punk shows and mm -hmm. and jazz clubs uh yeah the two kind of but uh, <laughs> i do remember the first show that i enjoyed going to with my dad at a big concert and it was paul simon mm -hmm. when he, the rhythm of the saints tour that record was uh i was that was just on repeat when that that year it came out for me i loved that record and so we went to see him he had michael brecker playing saxophone and all the african drummers and that was an amazing uh show it was at the what used to be the forum in la uh -huh. um, and uh that was the first big concert i remember like really being impressed by all of it like the music and then the lights and how it all worked together you know and that was the first time i got kind of struck by wow i think i like this you know as far as performing mm -hmm. i was i was into music already but like as far as like being on stage and seeing the what it is it was it was cool did you ever get to see uh phil collins because i know you're a phil collins guy right love phil collins i never saw him though i never got sponsored i never yeah. saw prince which i regret i never really had a chance to see him but but i regret not making making the chance uh yeah uh, yeah i didn't see i never saw van halen they're a huge mm -hmm. band for me that i never saw live uh lots of video of all of these people but never in person my parents were very strict, so I wasn't allowed to go anywhere. Uh, uh, when I started driving and that's when and working and had my own, it was more like, okay, I'm gonna go start doing this these things now. That so you're kind of make making it for lost time, then, huh? Yeah, I did a lot of it. Once I started driving, it was like every night I was out. <laughs> well, it must have been pretty surreal then, because uh, I mentioned Phil Collins because I know uh, at at NAM recently, I think it was this year, right? You got to meet uh, Leland Sklar, his well-known bassist who's been uh, in, in everything music-wise pretty much, right? <laughs> really a hero of mine, somebody who I always looked at and thought, I want to be like that guy, you know? He's one of the guys that even before I played bass, I was paying attention to and listening to, and it didn't even really register to me. I just was interested in him. And he's a great player and... It was such an honor to meet him. He was very nice. Uh, I'm hoping to hang out with him more. We live mm. close by to each other, but uh, uh, I didn't have a chance to really get in, you know, exchange any info with him. <laughs> I didn't want to get there. We just met. So, yeah. Yeah. He's a big, big influence. I just remember seeing him in the videos, with this big beard and, and then going, Oh, he's the guy that I hear on the record you know that's like killing but i didn't even play bass then i was into it because of mm. the, he always had great horn arrangements and of course the songs were amazing the production and everything do you know greg richling uh, he was the bassist for the wallflowers for a long time i had him on the show recently and now he's kind of getting into the uh, film documentary scene and he just okay. produced a documentary called the immediate family and uh Leland and Wadi Watel, those guys are in there. So it's a really good movie. You'd probably get a kick out of it. Yeah. What's it called? Uh, I think it's just called The Immediate Family. All right. Yeah, it was really good. And, and everyone's in it. There's all kinds of big musicians in it. It's, it was a really good documentary. Nice. Yeah. Well, I wanted to get into uh, one of my favorite musicians is Chris Cornell. I'm probably in the minority. I was into his solo stuff more than like Soundgarden. And I loved Audio Slave the best. And that's kind of how I discovered you. So I was just wondering, how did he discover you? Did he see you play somewhere? Or how did he know that he wanted you? Yeah. So when he did the Scream record, he was using that band that recorded that record on tour at first. And I guess there was a lot of internal like bullshit going on, people trying to get people fired and whatever, drama. So he... he wanted to just get it wiped the slate clean and get a whole new backing band so they held an auditions in la and uh i didn't even get the call he didn't know who i was at all i didn't actually get the call i i knew the guy who 
was putting the auditions on this guy Barry Squire, who's in LA. If you are a musician in LA, you probably know who Barry is. But uh, he he was putting on the audition. It was a big cattle call, lots of people. But I just happened to be in rehearsal with the guitar player who got the call. I hmm. used to play with this cat Rafael Moriera, and he he's from Brazil, but he went to MI and and uh, killing rock guitar player and we had a band and we were in rehearsal and he you know we're like rehearsing and he's like oh i gotta get this it's barry and and barry was calling him to do the chris audition and he he just right there on the phone was like well can i bring Corey and joey the dr you know the drummer that was in the band and he knew he knows us uh i had been auditioning for barry but kind of on the c plus b minus uh artists i guess i hadn't gotten to the level of getting those bigger calls yet and uh so he knew us he's like, ah, bring them all bring them because it's a big big call so it doesn't matter you know and that was it then wow. this was at the auditions and it was four days of of work to to audition i had to go back four times and every day learn five songs and uh play with Chris and they would put different people together and and um it was a pretty wild I had never done an audition like that like that big of an audition so it was a, it was a wild experience yeah well I was you, impressed that he was there and doing because I had done auditions for bigger artists where they didn't even show up hmm. you know? well that band uh the backing band it was really an amazing band you have Pete Thorne uh, Yogi, uh, Jason Sutter, uh, the drummer, I've seen him with like Cher and I think Joe Perry. So as you know, that was quite, uh, quite the band. Did you guys have good chemistry? Cause it, it always seemed like it to me. Yeah, we definitely had band chemistry. I, I think that, you know, those guys all knew each other prior. I didn't know any of them prior. Mm. Uh, so I was a little bit of, and I was younger and also not as experienced in, in that world. Uh, I had been touring but not again at that big level and uh i think that was the biggest gig for any of us but they had all been they're a little older than so they've been doing it longer and uh you know and and uh so but we had a we had a tight bond i had a really tight bond with with sutter uh he and i hung out a ton and uh yogi and pete were real close you know it was kind of like that's how it worked out we'd be gotcha. hanging we always we all hung out. It was like not like we didn't get along, but it just kind of seemed like, you know, we paired up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's got to be cool for you, too, because I saw you uh, in totally different environments. I saw you at Shoreline, a big outdoor amphitheater with Lincoln Park. And then I also saw you with Chris Cornell at the Fillmore on that Scream tour where you guys played the whole album and Timbaland was there. It was a very interesting show. I don't know if you remember a guy. He, I think he was one of the DJs or one of the kind of background guys. His name was Jerome, I think. And yeah, uh, yeah I ran into him at Safeway after the show at the Fillmore, and I gave him a ride home to the hotel. And I had no idea where I was going. I was like, oh, I'm gonna, he asked for a ride. I'm going to say yes. And somehow, some way in San Francisco, I got to the hotel without knowing where the hell I was going <laughs> and dropped him off. So it was always a fun memory for me. <laughs> That's funny. I just realized I said the wrong thing, too. His Chris had a band from the Carry On record. Scream came when we were we were already in the band. I I said that wrong, but yeah, yeah. Those those are we. Sorry, were you getting to a question? Oh no, I was just saying that's when I saw you guys. So so it must have been cool for you to play. You you kind of did it all with Chris theaters and big huge venues too, which must have been quite the trip. Yeah, it was crazy. I mean, the first gig we did with him was live on the radio with uh, on on K Rock. You know, like this show in L A. I remember being real nervous for that because it's a different environment doing something on the radio than a, than a live show. You're a little more exposed. Mm. <laughs> um, but yeah, and then we, you know, we we did probably the biggest show we did was Live Earth, and that was, you know, the crowd was over a hundred thousand, and then it was being broadcast live all over the whole globe. So it was like three hundred million people or something. <laughs> was that in Brazil? We did that in Europe. I think it was in Germany. But South America was crazy. South America was like uh, being in the Beatles because we would land uh, airport and there'd be just crazy crowds of people with signs and 
not just for Chris, for all of us, you know, <laughs> I was like, who am I, you know, it's lucky to be here. But, uh, uh, the, that was an amazing time, very special, memorable part of my career that, that I wish we could do again. Mm. When I saw Chris the last time, he I was expressing some gratitude to him, and he told me, "Don't worry, man. We're going to do more." And mm. and uh, so I was always kind of holding on to that hope, and uh, that was one of the. It was already heavy enough when he passed, but that was part of the heaviness for me was knowing that that's not going to happen again. You know. Yeah, that was one of the things too for me. Just as a fan, I remember hearing rumors. And I think he might have even said stuff. I, I might have heard it from like Tom Morello, maybe. But uh, he had mentioned wanting to do Audio Slave stuff, and I couldn't believe that. I thought that was a band that was just never going to be, and um, always going to be so bummed that you're never going to see them. He probably would have done it again. Yeah. Yeah. I just feel we, so bad for the Soundgarden guys just because mm -hmm. they just got restarted up, and and then boom, it's like gone again. You know, it's it's tough. Yeah. Well, do you have any special memories? Uh, last question on Chris, because uh, I think you went on tour like in 09, maybe. And I think it was in Europe or maybe Paris area with Lenny Kravitz. And Lenny's one of my favorite musicians. So do you have any good memories from that or anything? Amazing time. That was that was probably, I don't know if the, the funnest, but that was, I'm a big fan too. So every mm -hmm. night I was sitting in the pit watching Lenny, you know, <laughs> right fucking there, you know, and, and uh, he's so good. And he's such a great performer and uh and he's kind of the real deal you know he's he's really nice guy he hung out with us a bunch you know i remember the last show we played with him we all hung out on the bus and and he signed a bunch of posters for everyone and, and oh, took cool. photos and like he was hanging you know he's one of the guys that like i man i'd love to get that call lenny if you're listening <laughs> you ever need a bass player buddy I'll I'll put this as a, its own little clip and send it over. <laughs> <laughs> that that is like a dream gig for me. I mean, I love I love he doesn't play that much, but he does it right. Now you're with Lucas Nelson. Obviously, we mentioned that in the beginning. I thought it was interesting cuz uh I think you're are you a sports fan? Are you into basketball at all? Cuz I saw you follow Steph Curry and uh since I'm in Warriors country, I'm a big Warriors fan. Yeah, I used to be a big sports guy, but I it slowed down. I think COVID slowed it down way back for me and and i i not lost interest but i just kind of fell off it a little bit but yeah i mean sports and music always ha run in parallel for me and and the thing about music that i always loved was the collaborative effort like i i never had a dream or aspiration to be like my own artist like i always liked being in a band or a part of a mechanism per se and 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 you know that's how it is if you're on a baseball team or a basketball team you're part of this thing and it's uh it's all about how you work together to make the music you know mm -hmm. so yeah big, i love and basketball is so fun to watch yeah that's why i thought it was interesting because uh i got to interview some warriors players this year then also warriors players from their g league minor league team and you okay. have steve kerr coaching the warriors and then you have nicholas kerr his son coaching the g league team so I thought it was interesting with you. You've gotten to play with Lucas Nelson and Willie Nelson. So do you ever like notice mannerisms or it's just got to be kind of trippy to think about you've played with the father and son. <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, and there are a lot of, a lot of manner, a lot of similarities. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I think mainly just because Lucas has played with his dad all his life, you know, and, and, uh, that's kind of what his whole thing is modeled after. Not that he's trying to be Willie, but uh, you know, his voice naturally sounds like Willie's and he, I don't know. Willie's Willie's crazy. Like playing with Willie is like a psychedelic trip. Cause he's, he bends space and time, you know, and you have to really be, I remember the first time I sat in with Willie and his bass player told me, whatever you do, don't listen to Willie. <laughs> I was like, what do you mean, bro? Like that he's the lead. No, no, no. You listen to Willie, you're gonna be screwed. Just play the song. <laughs> okay. But yeah, I there's they're they're different beasts for sure. You know, there's subtle little things that you go, yeah, there's Willie in there, but uh but I they're they they have a different energy. 
Yeah. Well, when you're on tour, do you ever hit the golf course with Willie or Lucas? Because I saw Lucas at the uh, Pebble Beach Celebrity Golf Tournament a few years back. And uh, I shouted you out. I said, hey, Corey McCormick's a great bassist. And he just laughed and said, oh, yeah, I love him. <laughs> so do you golf with him at all? Or I have in the past. I'm not much of a golfer. I, I uh, shied away from golf because I'm kind of like, you know, when I do something, I want to get good at it. And I just feel like I don't have the time or the money to be good at golf. Yeah. Or maybe the patience too, right? Uh, it makes me a head case. <laughs> I think the patience, I think I could, I think patience is there. I don't know. I don't, wouldn't be easy, but just from like being a musician, I I know what it takes to over and over and over and over and over and do something and still suck at it. So I'm used to that. <laughs> um, but I, I think it's just the, I don't have enough. So just, I already have enough things I'm trying to be good at, you know, mm. like I still haven't mastered the music thing as far as I'm concerned as a my own personal uh level of of what a musician is i'm still trying to reach that so i think there's now, potential <laughs> you know i'm trying to learn japanese i'm trying to become uh, in japanese i'm you know i i do like sports i play tennis with my wife she was on track to be a, a professional tennis player so she uh, she's really good and and I love playing tennis, so we do that a lot. And, but golf, I don't know. I have problems. I have fundamental problems with the establishment of golf. To be oh. complete. It, like, is it uh, like the elitist part of it or what? The elitist part of it, the... I just feel like it's a, it takes up a lot of land and resources. Mm. A lot of it's funded by corporate things that I don't want to be part of. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. I think a lot of sports are, but I, don't know, I shouldn't get into that. <laughs> well, what, one uh, thing too about being a uh, part of Lucas Nelson and Promise of the Real is it caught my eye. You guys are in the Star is Born movie, right? So I remember seeing it in theaters and being like, wait, did I just see you in the film? That was kind of a crazy moment. Yeah, that was fun. Uh, we we did the soundtrack, so you, all the music you hear is us. There's a couple things that it aren't us, but and then they asked us to be in the movie and be his band, his character's band. So that was a trip. You know, doing the the filming the movie part was really boring and and tedious. Long was day. it at a real festival or no? Was it all put together for the scene? So we did uh, we did shoot one of the shots at Stagecoach. Mm. So what we did was Willie played a set and then right after he finished, we went on the same, we kept the crowd. We told the crowd what was happening and then they stayed and then they filmed us. We just kind of karaoke one of the songs. And then we did some filming at Coachella, the grounds there uh, where they brought in a bunch of like uh, Gaga's fans. And then I think they CGI filled it. Mm. it looked like a full concert yeah that's cool though did you get to talk much with bradley cooper like music at all or was it just kind of bam bam we had a lot of time with bradley in the studio oh cool yeah the studio time was the really the the fun part because we were we were just with it was just the band with gaga and bradley and wow. you know they kind of it would be like a bunch of Bradley time and then Gaga would come in. Sometimes they were together, but that was the most fun. And to see like Gaga's talent raw, like when she wrote the song Shallow, she came in all excited. She had it handwritten on paper and, you know, and she sat down at the piano and played it for us. And, and uh, just to see that raw wow. talent was, uh, you know, I get chicken skin thinking about it and then Bradley would amaze me because he's not a musician he took like vocal lessons and learned how to play guitar I think for the for the movie but uh his he was like an orchestrator like he he would have the scenes in his head and he would he would go like we need to have the song do this at this point you know because he had it all worked out hmm. beginning of the movie we're playing it's like a show and he comes off stage and gets in the limo or whatever and like snorts a pill or I don't remember exactly but when he gets in the limo you still kind of hear the music but you hear my bass going ball, ball. Ah. Like 
I'm repeating this note. And I remember in the studio him telling me, when we get to the end of the song, just keep playing. And I was so confused, like, you mean when the drums stop, keep going? He's like, yeah, yeah, just keep playing. And I didn't have a clue why. But then when I saw the movie, I was like, oh, that, he was orchestrating it to the scene. So that was cool. And anyone that can, like, learn how to sing, to yeah. get, oh, you know, I was pretty, pretty impressed by the whole thing. Are you in the Actors Guild now? or <laughs> Not in the Actors Guild, no. Uh, there is uh what's the union the, the i did get an extra union because of it though oh that's good yeah i'd it, i'd love to do more tv work playing or i even love acting you know we did the we did a neil movie that's on netflix we filmed that on daryl hannah's ranch in colorado mm. some rip that she wrote wasn't even finished and we just kind of threw this thing together but I, I enjoy like really acting. I kind of had fun doing that. I'll have to check that one out. Yeah, Paradox. It's on Netflix. Well, that leads into then uh, Neil Young. He, I know he lived in like Marin area, like in the North Bay for a while. Is he kind of intimidating to be around? Because I know, I think he first started watching you guys perform at like Farm Aid, right? Yeah, the first time I saw him watching us was pretty heavy. And I like... He, him and Cornell had the same kind of thing where I can't quite relax mm. around. It's not like that I'm nervous anymore, but I don't know. They're just such a big part of the folklore of music for me. And I grew up with just hearing and seeing them on TV. And, and so it's hard to kind of just be normal. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. No, you try as hard as you as hard as you can, and um, but, but yeah, he's he's always been Neil's always been very sweet to all of us. Um, he is intimidating, but but you know, once you get to know him and and uh, and you see that side of him, you you kind of go, okay, he's he can be intense. I've seen him be intense. He's not happy about stuff, but you know. He's human, so he's always been very sweet to us and to my family. And if he sends mm -hmm. us a Christmas gift every year, I mean, it's wow. really, really cool. Well, I know uh, your dad. I think your dad liked him, right? And played him in the car uh, when you were growing up. Yeah. So, do do you ever tell Neil that kind of like a full circle moment, or you just play it cool, or how do you kind of handle that? No, I don't think I've ever really told Neil. Never really had the that discussion about that. I try to keep it under wraps. Mm. I mean, the yeah. first song I learned on guitar was Needle and the Damage Done. So, but I don't think I've even told him that. I, I don't want to it... too fanboy. You know? Yeah. <laughs> well, I have heard like when he would do the bridge school shows, uh, Greg Richling from the Wallflowers said how he'd go to like Neil's house and there'd be all these big name musicians just kind of standing around at his house. Were you ever able to be a part of those or it sounds pretty surreal. <laughs> yeah. So we did bridge school a couple times and we were invited to that party at his house. I think once I went and it definitely just being at his place, that place that he had up there, you know, that property, we had gone there a couple of times because we had a, we had done a record that we uh, mastered there. His guy mastered it. So we went to the studios that he has. It's so cool. I mean, he's got like, you know, like an old tour bus sunken into the ground that's wow. turned into a mixing room. And then like this really beautiful studio and just the whole, you know, it's like, here's the tree I sat on when I wrote Old Man, you know, that kind wow. of shit blew my mind um i don't remember the party was cool you know i'm not very social so i i i, I kind of shy and, and I, I probably didn't talk to many people at the party. <laughs> well um one cool moment uh one of my favorite uh bands as well is uh, the red hot chili peppers and you had a cool video on your instagram it looked like it was like backstage and flea was like had a bass and was kind of acoustically kind of going off back there do you have a relationship with him at all or it looked like a really cool moment it was definitely a cool moment. I wish I had more of a relationship with Flea. We played a show with them that night. It, it was kind of a benefit private mm -hmm. thing. And uh, that was just, he was just walking around playing and he came into <laughs> our dressing room 
and uh, I actually missed that whole thing. My wife took that video, but my kid, you know, Ellis was there, so he he got to kind of hang out with him a little bit. But I didn't get to talk to him much that day. Um, I remember I was having a bunch of technical difficulties with my gear, so it was taking me away from. My goal was to talk to him that day, but mm. it didn't happen. But he's a big influence, you know. I love the chili peppers. I that's always the the example that like I give when I'm asked what do you see as your what you want for your band. It's like, man, I would love to be at that level where, you know, you can just tour the whole globe mm. for as long as you want. Yeah. Every time you put a record out, it's just like, you know, they earned it. Yeah. Well, uh, speaking of uh, your gear there, uh, you're a Yamaha guy. And uh, I saw a cool video with your custom bass. Uh, it's like blue and you kind of got like red, reddish, brownish kind of mixed into it. So is that kind of your go to one now or? That one is not on tour with me at the moment. I left that at home this time. I used to have a bunch of bases out with me, but we kind of shrunk things down. So uh, but yeah, that's when I'm I, I kind of wanted to take that off the road because it was getting a little dinged up, mm. preserve it a little bit. Uh, but I, I just used it on a gig in town, and I love that bass. It was a fun project. And I have a, a five-string now that kind of is the same idea but different color scheme. It's black and purple instead of the blue and orange. Uh, but it has the same features on it. I love that bass, too started when i went to japan in 2010 and mm. needed instruments because i was i needed an you know an upright and a, and a five string and a couple four strings i didn't want to ship gear all over there because it cost so much money and, and so they were cool enough to let me use some bases and that's how the relationship started with them awesome is that kind of leading into it sounds like you might want to do some music like like producing or are you gonna be writing your own songs maybe kind of in the near future or? i would love to produce i haven't done a lot of producing i mean i feel like i'm always kind of producing when in the bands i'm in but uh it would be fun to work with artists and just produce i haven't done a lot of that but yeah the focus for me going for this year is to try to i've never really tapped into who i am as an artist like I'm always giving to someone else, you mm -hmm. know, I'm always supporting someone else in, in trying to fit into whatever someone else's vision is, which is great. And I love doing that and I love supporting and, and all that, but I, I, I'm feeling more and more like I need to come to more of a, a place of who I am as an artist. And, uh, and so part of that is writing and put, trying to put out music i'm doing some instrumental writing and then trying to write lyrics you know song wise all kinds of stuff i like i want to do like a jazz record and i wanted like a a vocal you know songwriter kind of thing there's a bunch of stuff i'd like to do i just i want to really define what it is my sound is and what what I'm trying to say artistically. So that's where I'm at with that. So you'll be busy then. You'll have something you could always be working on then. For sure. Well, well Corey, thanks for coming on the show. It's been great to catch up with you. And uh, since you are on tour, I know it's the evening where you're at. So uh, what else is on the agenda? Are you kind of just taking it easy the rest of the night or? Yeah, I teach a class online for Chafee College. So mm -hmm. I'm going to catch up on some some more work uh, I got to correct some papers and get it's the end of the semester. So kind of getting things buttoned up and then try to find dinner. And that's about it. Awesome. Well, uh, Corey, it was a lot of fun to catch up with you. I'll put some uh, links in the bio and how people can follow you on uh, Instagram or just follow your career and uh, get to know you even more. So thanks for coming on the show. Beautiful. Thanks, Ryan.